Good evening and welcome. I'm so glad you could join us tonight and I am thrilled to be joined by a terrific colleague and friend Maurice. We are so glad you're here. Um, so uh, you're gonna get some great advice about the admissions process for New York high schools, which is its own special, wild and wonderful world. And we are so, so lucky to have Maurice Frumkin here who knows everything about it, having worked on both the private school admissions side and on the public school admissions side in the New York um, City Department of Education. So Maurice, thank you so much for being here and sharing your wisdom with us. Um, we're thrilled to be able to share good ideas and information um, in this um, wild and woolly time of ours um, and grateful to have a community joining us this evening um, near and far. Um, so we welcome you. Um, as folks are joining us, um, we're going to tell you a little bit about ourselves and what we do, but we'd also love to know a little bit about you. We'd love to launch a quick poll um, so that we can know if we're talking tonight mostly to students or parents or educators um, and where in this process um, the, the child that you are or the children that you are representing might be. So thank you for taking a minute to answer the poll as we get started. Um, my name is Ginger Fay, and I uh, lead a couple of teams here at Apple Ruth um, and and Abaruth is a really interesting education company. Um, I want to tell you just a little bit about the work that we do before um, Maurice gets started and in, in giving us the nitty gritty on the application process. So Maurice, let's go to the next slide. Um, so Alberuth is a, a company that's been around for about 20 years, and we believe really fundamentally that if you can change a student's self-belief, you can change their life. Um, really what we wanna do is give students the power to unlock their own potential and the belief that they have it within themselves to do. So we try to help students achieve whatever goals it is that they have set for themselves um, academically and personally. Um, we just are trying to build better learners and better adults in the end. That's the, the work of, of parents and educators is to eventually build a grown up. Um, so if we'll go to the next slide, there are three different ways that Alberuth works with students. We help students on academic tutoring. We work with students um, anywhere from sort of the, I would say late elementary, upper elementary school, um, all the way through college. Um, our tutors love working with students on lots of different subjects and helping them um, develop the confidence that they need to be successful in their classes. We work with students on high stakes admissions testing, and we're going to talk a little bit about that sort of thing tonight. So we work with students who are taking the IC, um, the SSAT, the SHASAT, um, um, for those of you um, thinking about that in New York. And then we also help students with executive function coaching. Um, so students who are struggling kind of not just with one academic class, but with putting it all together and with organizational skills. Um, and that all comes from our own uh, research and background in educational pedagogy. So we're thrilled to be able to work with your students and um, grateful for the chance to, as I say, share good ideas and information. There are three um, special things that we have coming up that I wanted to share with you all tonight in particular. Um, number one, if we can go to the next slide, is our academic success webinar series, which we're right in the middle of. Uh, if you missed the first one, which was earlier this month, um, please feel free to join us. You'll get the recording from the last one and you can join us for the next two. The beginning of the school year is always a time for new school supplies. I believed really strongly in the power of a trapper keeper um, back in the day. If I just had the right school supplies, it was all gonna work out. Sometimes you need school skills too. And that's what this webinar series is about. So we'd be glad for you to join us if that's something that would be helpful. Number two on the next slide, um, we're going to let you in on a little secret. Um, we have a back to school academic tutoring sale that starts next week, but because you're with us tonight, um, we can give you early access to that. Um, so we'll, we'll put in the chat in a bit um, how you can get in touch with us if that's something that would be helpful um, for you and your family. And last but not least, if we Hop to the next slide. Um, we are looking forward to offering a couple of chances to take um, the Shasat. If you want to take a practice test with us, um, we've got a couple of chances coming up to do that in September and October. Since we don't quite know when <laughs> the Department of Education is going to have the official Shasat test, um, these are some chances for students to get a little practice test uh, under their belts um, before the whole thing gets started. So 
enough about us and let's talk about Maurice. Um, so tonight we're going to get a terrific deep dive into the application process for high schools in New York City in particular. As I mentioned before, Maurice has a terrific background and a unique perspective having seen this process from multiple sides of the desk. I don't, it's an oval at this point and he's moved, he's moved around a lot of different places. So Maurice, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And I, I know that you've got a lot of information to share, but I know our audience might also have lots of questions that they wanna ask. So I'm gonna invite anyone who, who has a question to please feel free to put that in the chat um, or in the Q&A box. And we'll be glad to kind of squeeze as many um, answers to your questions as we can in the hour that we have together. Um, so feel free to pop those questions in as they occur to you. And I'll jump in at the end to um, hopefully help Maurice with a, a couple of A's to your Q's. Um, so without further ado, Maurice, the stage is yours. Well, thank you so much, Ginger and Jesse and the entire team at Apple Ruth. It's really an honor to be here tonight. And um, as Ginger mentioned, we certainly want to make the best use of your time. So here's the game plan. Um, I'm going to talk for probably 40, 45 minutes or so. And then as Ginger mentioned, we'll take some questions. We'll take as many as we can at the end in the last 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, you can sort of see my background. It's nice to meet everyone. I was with the DOE, I was in the independent school world, and probably about nine plus years ago, I went off on my own. And um, right now, my company works with families all across the city on everything from pre-K all the way up through college admissions. So happy to schedule time to talk to you, uh, your school, your family about your individual needs. Um, and we'll certainly give our contact information at the end. And if you're here tonight, I know there are a lot of eighth grade families here tonight and some students. So special thank you to the students you are considering this vast process that you've probably heard about already that is called applying to high school in New York City. And as I say all the time, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You've got a tremendous amount of choice, but because there's such a tremendous amount of choice, it's also incumbent upon families to do your homework, to make the right choices in an informed way. So what you're, what you're already seeing, if you're an eighth grade family, most likely, is that depending upon the types of schools you might be looking at and might represent the best fit for your family, you might be looking at a couple of different application processes, two, three different categories of types of schools, maybe a couple of different tests um, that are associated with those, those different types of schools. And I think one of the things that makes, you know, when people talk about applying to New York City high schools and it being, um, it can be an overwhelming process. I think part of what makes it seem like that is that depending upon the type of school you're, you're looking at, the criteria can vary and the admissions requirements can vary sometimes from school to school to school, even within the public school realm. So, Tonight, we're going to try to help you make sense of all that. And I will also sort of preface this conversation because I know a lot of you are anxiously awaiting information from the Department of Education. I do, I no longer represent the Department of Education, but I can say with clarity that there are some things that we know, and I'm going to give you as much information tonight as I can, and some things that we don't quite know yet. And I'll tell you a little bit more later about. Um, you know, our best guesses, at least based on publicly available information about when we might get more information. But if you're in the fall of eighth grade and you're starting this process or you've been involved in this process for some time now, you are most likely in the midst of developing lists of schools. You are most likely getting more clarity on what the exact requirements are for each school. Independent schools in particular, because over the past few weeks, we've learned a lot more about what exactly the requirements are and what the deadlines are. You are most likely, hopefully, starting to think, if you haven't already, about what your test prep plans are, talking to someone at Apple Ruth. And if you're thinking about audition prep also, you've started to think about what does that mean for my child? What is the best prep plan for auditions? And we'll talk more about the audition schools in a few minutes. And by now, if you haven't already, I highly encourage you to make use of the ever growing number of schools that are announcing events, particularly independent schools, 
And even starting to some events that are starting to trickle out on the public school side. But um, if not, if you haven't seen events for schools, you know, partially because of COVID, what's been going on over the past few years, so many schools have much more information, recorded videos, and things that you can take advantage of on school websites already, even before you have to take advantage, even, even before you can take advantage of live events. And I'm going to mention another event that's going on next week uh, for independent schools that I highly encourage you to take advantage of as well. Now, what has also kind of been trending in, in New York City over the past several years is this whole notion of not putting all your eggs in one basket. And I suspect that the families that I'm talking to tonight, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but this process for not only independent schools and public schools, not only one particular type of school, but in aggregate, I would say this process has become more unpredictable than ever. And it's harder for us, you know, we've been doing this a long time, but it's harder even for us to say to a family, you know what, we're pretty reasonably certain that you're going to end up with such and such school. Um, so if, if folks that have been doing this for years and years and years have a hard time predicting that kind of thing, we certainly don't expect families to be able to do that. So for that reason, I find that families that we work with, we're preaching this idea of casting the widest net possible, looking at as many different options as possible. And I frame this conversation by putting these different major categories of schools in different buckets, because depending upon how many of these buckets you might find yourself in, and I'm not suggesting that you should be in all of these buckets, by the way, but I do like it when families are looking at at least two, three of these categories, because that at the end of the day, what that's gonna translate into is probably the most options that you'll have as a family to choose from, as opposed to being stuck with something that, you know what, you might not be thrilled with. So at a glance, what I like to also get out of the way, um, and Ginger will talk, uh, talk to this a lot more later, is testing, right? So depending upon the, kind, the kinds of schools you're looking at, you're likely to be faced with at least one test. Now, that's not to say that you might apply to high school in New York City and not take any tests. It is conceivable. At the same time, the more different types of schools you're applying to, the higher the likelihood of, of um, taking one or more tests. And these are the major tests. These are not all of them, but these are the major tests that students tend to take for the different types of schools that you see in, in the second column from the left, whether it's the public specialized high schools and the SHSAT, many Catholic schools that require the tax exam, which is the test of admission for Catholic high schools, some independent schools, which still require either the ICs or the SSAT. And I say some because not nearly as many of those schools are requiring that test. And if you're applying to independent schools right now, you're probably seeing that, that more and more schools are test optional. And then finally, there are a smattering of schools across the city, public, private, and otherwise, that are sort of decide that have, that have decided that they want to have their own exam, and they may, ha, you know, offer their own school-based assessment that you sign up for in the fall, and it's primarily, um, uh, you know, proprietary exam that's offered by that school, and you take it at their school. So I want to just briefly cover the major types of schools that you might be thinking about or might want to think about. And then we'll go into a little bit more depth on um, the public school process only because, frankly, I find it to be one of the more complex, uh, ironically. Um, but we'll talk more about them, what to expect over the next few weeks. So if you're considering independent or private day schools in New York City, those terms are pretty interchangeable in New York City. Those schools tend to look at seventh and eighth grade record, um, as you can imagine, they're tuition based. Some schools are really, really expensive, others not so much. Um, they're typically known for smaller class sizes, courses, facilities, extracurriculars. And those applications, if these schools are on your radar, those applications, those deadlines, those events are available as we speak. And I'll just get the, I'll actually get this out of the way. I want to give a little plug to the Parents League. Uh, parentsleague.org, because next week, if you're starting to think about these schools and you haven't already uh, encountered the Parents League, the Parents League is having a really good a virtual school fair next week. 
So I'm going to give them a plug and encourage you to go to the parentsleague.org and check out that event next week because I think it's going to be really, really helpful for families that are looking at independent schools. And independent schools, finally, for the most part, offer need-based financial aid, not so much merit-based financial aid, but we'll talk more about that in a moment. And these are just some examples of names that you've probably heard of, a small sampling of independent schools throughout New York City. Now, one distinguishing characteristic of applying to independent schools in New York City is there's a lot to do. It's time consuming, whether it's the applications or the interviews or the essays or the questionnaires, um, in some cases, again, taking tests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's almost like applying to college. And if you're in the midst of this right now, you're also probably seeing that despite the fact that there is a central admissions hub called Ravenna that a lot of schools use, what I find to be particularly frustrating is that even though it's a central hub and there are some common elements that you can do once for multiple schools, each school's requirements tend to be slightly different from school to school to school. So I think now is a really good time, if you haven't done this already, to lay it out on paper, lay it out in a chart, and get the best sense possible of what the exact requirements are and deadlines are for each individual school. Now, Ravenna will spell it out for you for each individual school when you're in Ravenna, and it takes about three minutes, by the way, to sign up for a Ravenna account. What I don't love about Ravenna is that you can't look at all of your schools at a glance uh, to see what all the requirements are for in aggregate for all the schools that you're that are under consideration. But you can see for, in, for each individual school what all the requirements are. But big picture, one of the reasons why I like putting this slide up is not to intimidate you, but particularly if you're applying to multiple kinds of schools, as we said at the outset, which I recommend considering different kinds of schools, it can get really overwhelming if you're looking at public schools and the SHSAT schools and parochial schools and independent schools, and it really adds up. So at this time of year, if you're thinking, well, what am I supposed to prioritize? What should I focus on first? I think you really should be digging deep into the independent school applications right now because it's upon us. Things are really getting going in earnest right now, and there's a lot to do, and we know exactly what the timeline is. So for the most part, um, over the next six to eight weeks, families are not going to necessarily accomplish all the things that you see on the slide in front of you. But what they are going to focus on are things like getting the preliminary parts of the application in, starting to sign up for events. Um, start up, starting to sign up for interviews. Obviously, if you haven't already signed up for testing, you should do that. So there are a few, uh, pay real close attention to what the deadlines are because you can take it in bite-sized pieces. You don't necessarily have to do everything at once. Shifting gears for a second to, to parochial schools and in particular Catholic schools. Um, there are a good number, dozens of Catholic schools throughout New York City. and I think a great resource is the tax website, which is taxinfo, T-A-C-H-S, info.com, where you can really get a, a, a sense of the Catholic school landscape, borough by borough. And I think that the Archdiocese also does a really nice job of spelling out what the process is like, how to sign up for the exam. And by the way, the registration process is going on right now. And they've already told us when the open houses are, when the fairs are, when the exam is, the first week of November. So we, what I love about what I love about what the Archdiocese has done is they 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 lay it out for us pretty early on in the summer. Usually that happens around July if you happen to not be an eighth grade family. Now the Catholic schools are pretty much defined by the fact that yes, there's a religious orientation although you don't have to be Catholic for most, uh, except for one or two exceptions. And there are, you know, Catholic schools are actually getting more and more diverse over the years. Um, many of them do require the tax exam. Most, if not all Catholic schools require some kind of exam. If it's not the tax exam, it's a couple of other exams that I'll show you in a moment. Many of them are single, single gender schools. And the Catholic schools 
the application process ten, tends to be fairly straightforward in that they look at transcripts, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade academic record. Uh, they look at uh, attendance and standardized test scores. But a lot of that information is reported to the Catholic schools by your middle school. So there's not a lot of the, uh, the additional work that's required from the traditional independent schools in terms of essays and interviews and uh, these you know, time consuming applications and so forth. It's fairly, it's a fairly straightforward process. And the biggest part of the process is taking the tax exam. Now, when you take the tax exam, you choose up to three schools, you put them in your order of preference. Unlike the public school process, which I'm gonna get to in a moment, Catholic schools see how you rank them. And there are some schools, I, I encourage you to listen for this in the open houses. There are some schools that say, you know, we really don't care where you rank us. We're gonna consider you equally anyway. And there are some schools, frankly, that want to be their, that want you to list them as their first choice. But I think it's important to know that they see where you rank them. And I encourage you to ask that question as you're meeting with the schools. Um, other considerations for the Catholic schools, as I mentioned a minute ago, some of the Catholic schools will also accept the ICs, a test called the HSPT. And in fact, there are two or three schools uh, such as Xavier, uh, Fordham Prep, where um, the HSPT is the test that you would take to qualify for a merit scholarship. And by the way, that is also um, a distinguishing feature about the Catholic schools is that merit scholarships are a thing. As opposed to the traditional independent schools, I've worked with a lot of families with students that have uh, got that achieve, have achieved merit scholarships by virtue of their performance on the IC, uh, on the tax exam, rather. So that's that's really good to know. In addition to the fact that there are a good number of Catholic schools that are significantly less expensive than traditional independent schools, but go to the tax uh, website, check out the tax handbook. There was a good sample, a uh, couple sample exams in there, I believe. And the deadline to register for the tax exam is October 27th. There is also a deadline. I don't remember what it is offhand, but it's on the tax website. When you have to go onto the website and indicate what those three choices are of the Catholic schools that you're applying to when you're taking the tax exam. So that's really good to know as well. Charter schools, completely separate process from the regular Department of Education application that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Uh, just really quickly, what defines the charter school landscape in New York City is that it's a fairly small landscape. There are probably, you know, just a few dozen charter high schools in New York City. They're all lottery based. They're all tuition free. They all give some kind of, they all have some kind of priority structure to your to neighborhood, to siblings. And there is no limit to the number of charter schools you, you can apply to. For the most part, charter school deadline, the application deadline is April 1st of eighth grade. So in the spring, it's pretty easy to do. You apply to as many as you want. You have nothing to lose and it has zero impact on your public school application. So I wanna get to the public school application because um, I wanna get through this so we can take questions. And this is what I know a lot of people are wondering about at this point. There are three major buckets of what I'm gonna call DOE high schools as part of the DOE application process. So again, this is separate from everything we've talked about so far. It's separate from private schools, separate from charter schools, and separate from parochial schools. But there are three major buckets even within the DOE process. One bucket is the SHSAT schools, which I'm gonna show you in a moment. The second bucket is LaGuardia. And those two buckets comprise the nine specialized high schools. These are the infamous nine specialized high schools that everybody talks about. And those nine schools are separate from what I'm gonna call the main application, which is every other DOE public high school in New York City. And I'm gonna take you through the application and some strategies. Now, over the past few years, if you've been following what's going on, you probably have. Um, there's been a lot of, there have been a lot of changes over the past few years and admissions criteria for the public schools are very much in flux right now. And it's been in the news, as a matter of fact, there was a good article uh, in Chalkbeat this morning, if you've read it, I encourage you to do that, where they talked about just the fact that families are on eggshells right now, right? Um, they also mentioned that 
they believe, based on their reporting, that the chancellor is going to um, share a lot more guidelines as early as next week. So be on the lookout for that, but I encourage you to go to the Chalkbeat website. I'll give them a little plug as well. It's a great resource and check out the article that came out today about um, New York City high school admissions. So again, three buckets. There are the non-specialized high schools. These are just a few examples out of hundreds. There are more than 400 public high schools in New York City. And these, all of these schools, if you're not one of the nine specialized high schools and none of the ones you see in front of you are, all of the non, what I'm calling the non-specialized high schools go on the main application, which I'm gonna show you in a moment. So just keep that in the back of your head for a second. Key updates from this year's pat from this past year's process. So this is what happened this past year, not necessarily a reflection of what we're gonna hear over the next few weeks from the DOE. So this is a big asterisk subject to change, but what we've seen over the past few years is that there are no more schools. Again, this is just DOE schools. There are no more schools that have any kind of district priority. There are no more schools that have any kind of like geographic catchment area priority. There are still some schools that have borough priority that give priority to their own borough. Small handful, not a lot, but there are still some of them. And there are also, you may remember if you were following along last year, there was this back and forth about whether or not there were still going to be any zoned high schools in New York City. There still are. Um, and I suspect that will stay that way. I, I don't say that with no, having any kind of intelligence from the, from the DOE, but I suspect that we will still have zoned high schools this year. Most students throughout New York City do not have a zoned high school. If you live in Staten Island, everybody does. If you live in Manhattan, nobody does. And if you live in other parts of the city, it depends on where you live. And I'll tell you the implications of that in a, in a few moments. But I think the, um, in addition to that, last year, the past couple of years, but particularly last year, the timeline was drastically delayed, drastically delayed. I mean, the application deadline last year was March. SHSAT results came out in April. Um, everything was really, really delayed. I don't expect that things are gonna be as delayed this year as they were last year. And if you remember, if you're sort of a follower of this process for years, you may remember a time pre-COVID when the application deadline was in December, the SHSAT was for most kids in late October and results came out in early March, which followed on the heels of when independent school results tend to come out, which is in late February. Now, we'll see if, if we revert back to a quote unquote normal timeline. I have my doubts, given the fact that we're already in mid-September. Um, but again, I don't expect we're gonna be as significantly delayed as we were last year. And last thing before I go to the next slide, um, yes, there will be a mix. We're already seeing a, a little flurry of activity in terms of public high school events starting to be announced. Um, one of the million dollar questions that I know is on everybody's mind is what is screening going to look like this year? Will, will any schools have any kind of academic screen? And if they do, what is it going to look like? So um, we're going to find out a lot more over the, with, from the DOA over the next few weeks, but I'm going to get back to that point in just a moment. Um, if you haven't already started to familiarize yourself with the online high school directory. Again, this is only for DOE schools. I encourage you to start getting familiar with myschools.nyc. Myschools.nyc serves kind of a dual purpose. It is the online DOE high school directory. It is the definitive, you know, last word on, um, you know, the, the definitive DOE high school directory. There is no more paper high school directory. There's a small guide on the DOE website called the admissions guide that the DOE puts out, but it is not as comprehensive with respect to giving you information on each and every school in New York City. And it is not as comprehensive with respect to individual school admissions criteria as myschools.nyc. The other purpose of myschools.nyc is eventually you're gonna have the opportunity to log in and use that system to actually submit your application. 
to fill out your list of 12, the main application that I was talking about a few minutes ago, and to do things like register for the SHSAT, register for LaGuardia. And I actually think I have a little screen in a moment I'm gonna to show it to you. So it serves a dual purpose. You can't log in yet. I know families are already getting anxious. They're, they're wondering where their access information and their login information is from iSchools. Nobody can log in yet. The DOE is going to give the go ahead to do that. And you'll hear from your counselor, your school counselor, in terms of when you can get that login information. In fact, um, there comes a point in time, typically, when the DOE will mail that information out to public school students. But for students in independent schools, you will get that information from your school counselor. OK, so eventually, there are a few things you'll do in, my in the My School system. So remember, we've got these three buckets, right? We've got the main application where you're going to fill up, you're going to fill up the application with up to 12 choices. And I'm going to talk in a few minutes about how to do that. And you're going to rank them and you're going to list them in the, on, in the online application in My Schools once you're able to log in. The other thing that you're going to be able to do in My Schools, separate from the main application, is apply to the SHSAT schools and or LaGuardia High School. So either or the uh, either the, the SHSAT schools or the Guardia High School or both. You'll do that separately from the main application. The DOE and your counselor are going to give you the go ahead. Again, you can't do this yet, but they're going to give you the go ahead in terms of when that registration period starts. It is not first come first serve. I know a lot of families are really anxious to they think that, oh, boy, I better do this right away. You don't have to. Typically, the DOE will give you two, three weeks to get it done, and it gives you no advantage whatsoever to do it on day one. So separate from the main application, you're going to register if you choose to. This is optional for the specialized high schools. And these are separate from the main application, as I keep saying. Um, you can apply to up to eight of the SHSAT schools, and then above and beyond that, you can apply to up, of, up to the six programs at LaGuardia High School which are the fine arts programs and the performing arts programs. And these are the nine specialized high schools. I highlight LaGuardia at the bottom only because LaGuardia, remember, does not require the SHSAT. You don't take the SHSAT for LaGuardia. LaGuardia has an audition process that you register for. So if you're asking yourself now, should I take the SHSAT? The first question to ask yourself is, are these, do these schools represent a pretty a decent fit for my child? And the answer is not always yes. Now there are, you know, 26, 27,000 or so kids who take this test every year for these eight schools. So they're, you know, generally regarded as the, uh, the most, some of the most highly sought after schools in New York City, but they are not the only ball game in town and they're not for everyone. And when you take this test, this has not changed. There are only three things that determine eligibility for one of those eight schools because you're eligible for up to one offer to an SHSAT school when you take that test. It's based on your score, of course. And typically qualifying scores run from around 490, give or take, all the way up to the mid 700s. It depends on the year. We don't know what they are for this year yet. So I just want to preempt to that question because we get that question all the time. Nobody knows what the thresholds are yet because the DOE hasn't even set them yet. Um, so it's based on your score. It's based on the choices of the SHSAT schools you make. So you don't have to apply to all eight of them. But when you register, again, in my schools, they're going to ask you for which of those, which those schools, which of the eight schools you're interested in, and to put them in your order of preference. And you will put them in your true order of preference. There's no gaming. There's no secret strategy to how to rank the SHSAT schools. And number three. It's based on the number of offers that are made to each of the schools. And that varies a little bit each year. That has not been determined yet. But it's only those three things that determine eligibility to the SHSAT schools. Um, there's no wait list for the SHSAT schools ver, uh, as there is for the non-specialized high schools. And yes, you can get an offer to an SHSAT school and something from your main application, and in some cases also from LaGuardia. Um, so really quickly, if you're thinking about auditioning for either LaGuardia or any of the other audition-based programs throughout New York City, and I say audition-based because I want to be really clear, when you're applying to high school in New York City, you apply to a program within a school, technically, and there are some programs that have an audition. 
There are some programs that might have some screening criteria. There are some programs that might be pure lottery. So I'm going to get to the back to that in a moment. But I want I just want it to be really clear that when you're looking through schools and particularly programs within schools, you're going to flag programs that require an audition. So whether it's LaGuardia, which uh, all of their program, all of their six programs require an audition or any of the other audition programs from the non-specialized high schools, I encourage you, if you haven't already, check out the DOE website and look at what the audition requirements were last year. Now, do we know exactly what they're going to be this year yet? No, we don't. It's not official, but I suspect they're not going to be too different from what they were last year. Last year, uh, for the most part, auditions were online. You submitted them online. Um, we'll see if that holds up this year and whether or not it's going to be uh, more of a hybrid online in person. We don't know yet. But I do highly encourage you to check out these guidelines if you haven't already, especially if you're in the midst of preparing for auditions. So again, remember you're applying to programs within schools. So when you go inside the My School system, you're going to see that each school has programs that you can apply to. Now, some schools have one, one program. That's the only thing that you list on your list of 12. And other schools, like the one you see in front of you, have many programs that you can apply to. And each program represents one choice on the list of 12. And ultimately, you're going to put them all in your true order of preference because high schools don't see how you rank them. And I'll get more back to ranking in a moment. The other thing you're going to see, and I'm sorry, I'm going through this pretty quickly, but you'll, you will get the recording of all of this if you are so inclined to listen to me for so long again. But um, the other thing you're going to see in my schools is this thing called demand. And you're going to see there are two applicant pools for every program, which tells you how many students applied last year, how many seats there were. It gives you a sense of demand. And this, uh, this stat is a really important one because what you're going to hear over and over, I can tell you now, from your counselor and from the DOE is that it is not generally recommended strong good practice to only apply to schools that have the highest applicant to seat ratios for obvious reasons. There are schools you will see that have applicant to seat ratios of you know, 50 to 60 to one upwards of that, all the way down to you know, five to one, 10 to one. Diversification is key. Now I'm not saying, because uh, uh, I know this is already probably what you're thinking, well, if I'm applying to a school that has a five to one applicant to seat ratio, I'm not gonna wanna go to that school because it's not in demand. I'm not saying it's easy to come up with a diversified list. However, your counselor, whoever you're working with, whether it's us or somebody else, will help you develop a really well-rounded list so that you're not only applying to long shot kinds of schools. The other thing I wanna mention before I go on is that for some students with IEPs that qualify for supports more than 20% of their instructional program. So if you have an individualized education program and uh, you're entitled to certain supports throughout the course of your instructional program, um, you may or may not meet that 20% threshold, which is the threshold that the DOE defines and the, as um, qualifying students to fall into the separate, what, I, what uh, you see as the students with disabilities applicant pool. So let me just say that really quickly again. Some students with IEPs will meet that 20% threshold and will fall into this separate applicant pool. And I encourage you to talk to your counselor, talk to us, um, whoever you may be working with about the implications of what it means to apply in that applicant pool. Now that's not a choice, by the way, you're placed automatically into one applicant for pool versus another. The majority of students across the city automatically fall into the general ed applicant pool. Um, you're also going to come across concepts like priority groups and admissions methods. So I want to talk about admissions method for a second. If you were listening closely, you probably heard me a few minutes ago talk about the fact that every program in New York City, including the specialized high schools, every program has an admissions method associated with that program, which tells you how candidates are considered, how they're evaluated. And you're going to see these names, and this is somewhat very analogous, actually, to the public middle school admissions process. You're going to see admissions methods like a screened admissions method, which typically have some kind of academic screen. Again, we don't know what screening is going to look like this year. We'll find out hopefully um, in the next couple of weeks from the DOE. 
you will see admissions methods called ed opt, which is a sort of a forced distribution to ensure academic diversity. So they take a lot of different kinds of academic levels within ac educational option types of programs. You're also going to see open admissions method, um, which means it's a lottery. You'll see audition programs like the ones I was talking about a few minutes ago, where an audition is required. You'll come across zone programs, and especially you'll want to pay attention to this if you live in the zone of a zoned high school, because you may want to take advantage of that zoned guarantee, which I'm going to talk more about in a second. And if you're a student who's only been living in the United States for a few years, um, where you might be, uh, where English might be um, a second language for you, you might come across some programs that are screened for language, might, which might be of particular interest to you. So these are the major admissions methods that I want you to pay attention to because they tell you how candidates are evaluated. And you're going to hear about these admissions methods, by the way, also when you meet with your counselor, when you go to your school's uh, information sessions and so forth and so on, and you'll hear the DOE talk about these as well. So I don't expect you to have mastered these um, yet. Then you're going to come across a term called admit a concept called admissions priority groups. Now, some schools don't have any priorities. They don't give any, they don't give priority to anybody over anybody else. You just apply, it's either a lottery, maybe there's some kind of screen, but there's no hierarchy other than that. But there are a lot of, there are also a lot of schools that have some kind of hierarchy that might give priority to certain applicants based on the borough that you live in. Remember I said a while back that some schools still have borough priority, some schools. Some schools still have zone priority. There are a handful of 25, 30 high schools across the city that are part of the DOE's diversity and in admissions initiative, the DIA initiative. So if you hear that term, that basically means that those schools are allocating and prioritizing a certain percentage of students who are eligible for free or reduced price lunch. You can see a very detailed explanation of that on the DOE website. And then there are some programs that give priority, some schools that give priority to their own students. So if I'm at a school, a middle school that continues from middle school to high school, I know that I have a guarantee if I apply back to that high school to go to the school if I list it somewhere on my application. And it doesn't have to be my first choice. I could list it below some other preferred choices. It's still going to be a guaranteed option if I don't get into something that I listed above my guaranteed continuing school choice. I know this is a lot, so I'm going to rush through this in the next few minutes because I want to take questions. How many should I list? We want you to get to 12 if you, the 12 that you're willing to consider, but we want you to get to 12. Why do we say that? Because almost 100% of students that put down 12 get matched to one of your 12. So let me repeat that. Of the students that put down 12, and there are a lot of students that don't, but if you put down 12, almost 100% of, of those students will get matched to one of your 12 choices. Now, what I am not saying is to put down something just to fill up a spot that you have no interest in. So please don't come away from this conversation saying, well, Maurice told me to fill up 12, even if I don't like something. That is not what I'm saying. I am saying that you should work really, really closely with your counselor, with an admissions professional to get 12 if you possibly can, because the numbers bear it out. Ranking really quickly. Ultimately, you're gonna rank in your true order of preference. High schools don't see how you rank them and you wanna rank one through 12 in your order of preference. Why? Because not only do schools not see how you rank them, but because some people say, well, if they don't see it, what does it matter? Well, it matters because the matching algorithm starts at the top of your list and works its way down. So if you put something that's at the top, that's not really your top choice, it's gonna start at the top and guess what? You might get it and you might get something that you really don't prefer over something you listed lower or vice versa. So the bottom line, because I want to get to questions, we want a diversified, robust list to get to 12 if you can. We want variety in terms of admissions priorities, admissions methods. There is no general formula. It is student specific. Talk to one of us. We don't expect you to know what a balanced list is, especially because we don't know what screening criteria are yet. We're going to find out really soon. And once we find out, will have a much better sense of what a well-balanced application looks like. And this is just to give you some, you know, to kind of illustrate my point, hopefully to drive it home a little bit more. Um, as you can imagine, we don't like seeing 
an application like student A has submitted, where they've only applied to eight schools. And all those eight programs are highly selective programs that everybody's applying to that have 50 to one applicant to C ratios. Student B, on the other hand, much more diversified list, they got to 12. Now, again, as I said on the bottom left-hand corner here, there might be a case where you might be willing to consider your, your own continuing school as your last choice backup or your zoned high school and the zone program within that zoned high school as your last choice backup. So what happens if I don't have a robust diversified list, if I don't get one of my choices? 7% of students across the city, that's a big number, um, last year did not get matched to one of their choices. So what happens? The DOE then assigns you to a school. For obvious reasons, we don't want that to happen. So this is why we're shooting, we're, you know, our goals are diversification, getting to 12, all the things that we've talked about today. When you get your results, I'm not going to go through all these scenarios, but everybody gets something. But again, last year, that something included the 7% who were placed by the DOE at a school that they never chose in the first place. On the other hand, we also know that roughly 50% of students got matched to their first choice, and roughly 75% got matched to one of their top three choices. So those are actually better numbers than what we've seen in previous years. Um, so, and there is a waitlist process. So there are kind of three scenarios when, 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 op, when results come out. Option one, you don't need to do anything. You're happy with your result, or maybe you get to choose between a specialized high school and something from your main application. Option two, there is a waitlist process. We don't want you to have to rely on the waitlist process. I do a whole webinar on the waitlist process later in the spring, so stay in touch with that. And um, we will also at that point talk more about, you know, what if I have a hardship? What if I want to appeal, even though there's no formal appeals process anymore, but what if I have a legitimate hardship associated with the school that I got matched to? What do I do in a case like that? We'll cover more of, uh, of that in the spring. This was the, the sort of the staggered timeline of when results came out this spring. I suspect it's not going to be the same this year, primarily because the public schools I doubt are going to come out at the in this schedule. We'll see. You know, for the most part, um, we expect the results from parochial schools, independent schools, boarding schools will come out roughly at about the same time. Next steps for eighth grade families, and then we'll, I'll, I'm going to hand it back to Ginger. Loop into key resources. Go to the Parents League website. Take advantage of their virtual fair next week. I think it's going to be a great event, especially if you're looking at independent schools. Check out school websites. Use videos. Sign up for the DOE emails schools.myc.gov i'll give that the url in a moment schools.myc.gov hyphen sign up sign hyphen up i'll give you that in a moment um know who your guidance counselor is and um segue to talk to apple roof figure out what your audition prep options are and what makes sense for you and your family. And these are the resources that I talked about. So it's schools.myc.gov hyphen sign hyphen up. And I'll just leave this on here for a couple seconds. Um, again, Parents League, it's parentsleague.org. I apologize, I didn't put the URL there. And if you haven't already, if you're applying to independent schools, set up an account on Ravenna. It's ravenna-hub.org. Um, I guess I think I'll turn it back to Ginger at this point. Is that right, Ginger? We have quite a few questions, um, so we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, thank you so much. This is incredibly helpful, Maurice. And we've had several folks commenting in the Q and A box that it is complicated, right? I mean, it is it is a lot of things to keep track of, and as you mentioned, a lot of processes happening simultaneously and yet somewhat out of sync from one another. So, um, the work that you and your team do with students and families um, is a, a real gift to them um, because this is incredible challenging and a, a great deal to manage. So um, if you do have more questions, I encourage you after tonight, I encourage you to reach out to Maurice and his team at New York City AdmissionSolutions.com um, and you'll get a lot of good advice and support there. Mm -hmm. um, so the first question is about testing. So I'm happy to answer that. Is the um, tax exam similar to the Shasat? Um, and the answer is both um, like so many things, yes and no. <laughs> um, in, in, in the work that we do. Um, some of the material covered is 
uh, the same on both tests. So there's reading comprehension and math sections on both of the tests. Probably the biggest differences are that the tax um, exam also includes things like capitalization and spelling, and those are not um, on the Shasat. Um, and there's also like an ability section on the on the tax exam that's a little bit different. So that I think if you were prepping for both, I would sort of start with the Shasat and then do the additional um, prep that you'd need to do for the tax exam because it does have some some additional um, sections and and um, material. Um, we have another question about what's a zone. Um, so you talked a little bit about zones and zone schools and things like that. Could you just clarify what is considered a zone? Yeah, so there are certain geographic zones throughout New York City. And again, if you're a Manhattan resident, you don't have a zoned high school, but there are certain pockets of Brooklyn um, and every resident of Staten Island has a zoned high school. So, so what does that mean? First of all, how do I find out if I have a zoned high school? Um, you can go to one of two places. You can either go to the DOE School Finder, which is on the homepage of the DOE website, and look up what your zoned high school might be. And I want to give another plug um, to InsideSchools.org, which is another great resource to research public schools throughout New York City. And Inside Schools has a school search guide uh, tool that you can also use to identify your zoned school. Or, uh, frankly, you can call 311 and you can talk to the New York City and ask them what your zone school is. You're also gonna see it once you can log into the My School system, you'll see whether or not you have a zoned high school. But the implication of that is that if you're interested in your zoned high school, and you may or may not be, but it can be a guaranteed backup. Now, for many zoned high schools, they have more than just the zone program. So you can potentially apply to even more than one program, but the zone program is the one that's going to give you the guarantee and the backup. So you always, if you're applying to your zoned high school, you always want to put your zoned high school at the bottom of your application, whether that's, you know, number three on your application or number 12 on your application. It should always be at the bottom. Thank you, Maurice. We, there was another question that was sort of, that was um, specifically about the zone school. And if you're putting it on the list of 12 options, will the DOE just default to your zone school or not necessarily? Great question. No. And the reason for that is, um, you know, a few moments ago, I was talking about how the, the, the way the matching algorithm works is it looks at your choices in your order of preference. So let's say I put my zone program as my 12th choice. The only scenario in which I would be matched to my 12th choice zone program is if I didn't get my top 11 first. So the algorithm is never going to jump down. And I, that, that also applies to, you know, some families say to me, well, Maurice, I don't want to put, I have eight choices that I'm comfortable with. I don't want to put this as my ninth choice because yeah, it might be a little, a little, give me a little bit more backup, but I might get, get, get it ahead of some of my other preferred choices. That doesn't happen. Again, the only scenario where you would get your lowest choice is if you didn't get anything you listed above it. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, a question about the Shasat and sort of how can those scores matter so much if the, if the, if the results aren't coming out until after the applications are due and so close to placement decisions. So can you talk a little bit about how sort of the whole process has to shift if the, if the Shasat test date shifts? Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but let me give it a shot. Mm -hmm. um, you will, regardless of when the SHSAT is, you will still have the opportunity to choose between an offer you get to a specialized high school and something you get from your main application. So I know maybe this is in reference to the fact that for the past couple of years, the SHSAT results have come out a little bit earlier than the main application results. Um, but you still have the opportunity to choose. The, you know, there was a time before pre-COVID when everything came out at once. And you know, we'll see, that could happen again this year. We'll see how that works. But even if it doesn't, um, you know, let's say the SHSAT is, a lot, is offered a lot sooner than the regular application is due. And the SHSAT results might be available to the DOE earlier than the main results are available. The DOE might decide to stagger them again and separate them out, but you'll still have the opportunity to choose between them if you get multiple offers. I hope that answers the question. 
I think it does. Thank you. Um, we've got a student who's interested in several schools that are part of the DIA initiative that you mentioned. And she wonders, should she still apply even if she doesn't qualify for reduced um, free or reduced lunch? Um, or are the chances just too slim to, to even bother? Great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, yes, it's kind of what you were saying, Ginger. Yes and no. So yes, you should not automatically assume that you are disqualified. You should not automatically assume that it's a waste of time. However, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before about diversification. You know, a lot of these things do, honestly. Where you start to run into trouble is where, you, where you're applying to most schools where you fall into a lower priority group, whether it's a school that's in the DIA initiative, whether it's a school that where you're in a lower priority group for whatever reason. If I, if I fill up my list of 12 choices, which is great, but then I look a little bit closer and I fall into a lower priority group for every one of those choices, that's where you can run into trouble. So diversification, 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 talk to your counselor, talk to one of us so that we can help you assess whether or not your, your application is, is well balanced. Thank you, Maurice. Can you talk a little bit about the application process for twins? Um, for students, um, parents who have multiple children going through this process at the same time? Yeah, so there's something new called multiples, which the DOE introduced last year, where basically you can apply to the same schools as twins, and it can actually increase your chances of the twins ending up in the same school. It's not a guarantee necessarily all the time, but you can increase your chances. So if you're, if you're saying to yourself as a parent, you know what, um, we're interested in the same schools, we want our kids to stay together, how do we maximize our chances of doing that? The way you do it is, again, when the, when the application opens in the My School system, you'll see that there's um, you know, basically a checkbox that you'll check off to indicate that you want to take advantage of what, this, what the DOE calls multiples functionality. So that's, that's the way to take advantage of that. Now, if you don't care about your twins ending up in the same school, then it won't apply. Then everything is essentially um, you know, operating uh, um, independent of one another. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the mythical magical lottery? <laughs> um, some people are asking about how do they find out what their lottery number is? What does it mean? Um, do they have to go get it? Does it just magically appear on your forehead when you're old enough to apply? Is it like, you know, Wakanda? It's like in your, in your lip somewhere. Yeah. I'm surprised it took this long for somebody to ask. Um, <laughs> So here's the, the there's, there's a misconception that this, this is a new thing. It's not a new thing. These lottery numbers, what I call these unique identifiers have existed since this process has existed. Now, what has changed is that more programs have had more of a lottery orientation. So I think over the past few years, that's where it's become more top of mind for a lot of people. And they've said to themselves, wait a second, we didn't, you know, we didn't sign up for this. So um, what's going to happen is every applicant gets a unique lottery number. And what the DOE did last year, I believe for the first time ever, was they shared lottery numbers with everybody. Now, it happened at the 11th hour, uh, but that's a whole other conversation. But everybody got their lottery number. When you're going to get their lot, your lottery number this year, um, I, I can't answer that question. The DOE will be able to share that with families, hopefully. That will, that will coincide when you're able to, to log into the My School system so that you have plenty of time before you submit your application. So what are the implications? I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, you know, um, non-DOE data that's out there, some of it which is, I would say, reliable, some of it which is not so reliable about how to interpret these lottery numbers. As a first step, what I, what I encourage you to do is go on the DOE, we, we, DOE website. There's actually a pretty good section if you go to the homepage and search for uh, random numbers, and it'll take you to a section that'll give you the basics on how uh, lottery numbers work. And now what I would say is I think the DOE unfortunately plays down the role of, of lottery numbers and knowing your lottery number. So I think that there is, a, uh, there is something to be said for knowing what your lottery number is and knowing the implications of your lottery number once you get it. And the, when I'm saying implications, I'm talking about what the impact that can have on the programs that you're applying to. And that is where I would highly encourage you to talk to an admissions expert, um, your counselor, 
about, about that. Like, what does this mean for my application? I, I have a lottery number that looks like it's not such a great one. What do I do about it? Or vice versa, I have a lottery number that looks amazing. What does that mean? Um, but that's sort of the really quick 30 second lottery number 101. That is very helpful because we are here at the end of the hour and we do still have a few um, questions from folks. So I want to encourage people to reach out to you directly, Maurice, if they have more specific questions to their individual situation. And I hope you and your team can be helpful. We will be sharing a copy of um, this recording with everyone who is registered for the program tonight. Um, and we're grateful to you, Maurice, for, for sharing such good information and so many different links and places we can go for resources and things like that. Um, as we close, is there just, you know, for people who are feeling kind of overwhelmed, there's so much to do, what, what's the one thing to start with? What's the one thing that, that um, I should start with if I'm a parent who's feeling a little bit overwhelmed by this process and I'm trying to find the best fit for my child? What should I, what's the one thing I should try and do first before I get lost in the, the, the mire? It's a great question. I, I, can I say two things? You may, but only, would, because, only because I like you a lot. <laughs> I would say know who your counselor is because they are your first line of defense. Um, and I work with counsel, some amazing counselors across the city each and every day. I mean, of course, we would love to speak with you. This is our business, but know your counselor. Number two is I would say in the grand scheme of things, the highest priority right now are the independent schools. So familiarize yourself with that process take advantage of the Parents League event next week. I think it's going to be really good. Um, talk to an admissions professional and just get a lay of the land with the independent schools. But that really is the highest priority right now. If you're not applying to independent schools, then I would say the first thing to do is start to develop a list of schools, start to monitor websites for schools of interest, because those public school events even are starting to trickle out a little bit. And it's not too early to start to put some of those things on your calendar. And finally, Think about your test prep and audition prep options, including talking to Apple Ruth. Thanks, Maurice. We're glad to be part of students' journeys. We love being part of Building Better Learners for Life. We thank you for your partnership and support um, and the information you shared with everyone tonight. Um, we wish you all the best on the journey ahead. Um, your kids are off for great adventures. Um, we're hearing so many good things about the, the hope and the energy that this generation is bringing to their education and will continue to bring to our world. We're grateful for that. Um, so thank you for helping them get launched on their way to high school. We wish you all the best. Good luck and good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ginger.